says there will be no more arrests. Smoke and flame from the tallest building in the southeast, Atlanta's First National Bank, but firemen won a quick victory about an hour ago. Truman Capote and Princess Lee Radziwill are in Atlanta, and in sports, Southeastern Conference basketball begins tonight. Live from White Columns, Television Center of the South, in Atlanta, capital of the South, comes Newsroom. First, the top stories from the nation and around the world with Ray Moore and Dick Horner. Brought to you by Eastern Airlines. Now, here's Ray Moore. Good evening. Bad news for Alabama today. Some school desegregation strategy by the Governor Wallace's has backfired and the echo reverberated from the Supreme Court. Months ago, Alabama sought to slow down school desegregation by placing all local school boards under state jurisdiction. But the result has been just the opposite. Instead of considering one school district at a time, the federal court was able to desegregate all Alabama schools with only one court order. Last March, a federal court directed the state to inform 99 local school systems to carry out a model integration plan which the court had worked out. The ruling was appealed, but today the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the lower court. So Governor Lurleen Wallace and Alabama educational officials have been ordered again to desegregate the entire Alabama school system. And there's a hint of an important ruling to come in the matter of open housing. In St. Louis, a private real estate developer refused to sell property to a Negro. So the Negro, Joseph Lee Jones, went to court. He said that both the Constitution and a law passed during Reconstruction are on his side. A circuit court of appeals ruled against the Negro. Today, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case later on. The court has emphatically prohibited states from discriminating on the basis of race. The big question in the St. Louis case is whether it's only a private matter or whether the state is involved because of licensing, zoning, and other regulations imposed on the private developer. More news follows this message from Eastern. He first learned about food as a boy, going to market with his uncle. At 13, he was fencing champion at the academy, but his dream was to be a chef like his uncle. So after the lycée, he became an apprentice and within 15 years worked his way to first chef. For the next five years, he temporarily lost interest in food. But 20 years later, he received the highest honor any chef could get, the Prosper Montaigne. He's Jean-Pierre Bequet, the head chef at New York's famous Voisin restaurant. But he also cooks for Eastern Airlines, right in his kitchen at Voisin, preparing the meals for selected flights on Eastern's ionosphere service. Most airlines just get a man's recipes, but at Eastern, we had to get the man. We want everyone to fly. Communists in London say they do not think a pause in American bombing would bring Hanoi to the peace table. These diplomats who have been in touch with North Vietnam say that Ho Chi Minh is optimistic that world pressure and demonstrations in America will bring victory to the Reds. Further reasoning is that an apparent return to more normal conditions in China will mean more help from them for the North Vietnamese. And the Russians are able to test their rockets and other war machines against the Americans, all that from communist diplomats in London. Texas Republican Senator John Tower has just come back from two weeks in Vietnam. He says the U.S. is winning, that the only place we can lose this war now is in Washington. Senator Tower says continued agitation by peace demonstrators may lead to a pullout. At the same time, New York City police are making plans for and expecting big anti-war demonstrations on Wednesday. Heavy fighting today in the Mekong Delta area. The Viet Cong was trying to cut Saigon's main supply of food from the rice bowl. So U.S. troops and South Vietnamese Marines hit them about 65 miles southwest of Saigon, using in part a hundred-year-old weapon, Civil War-type gunboats. The gunboats are armor-plated, and they're called monitors, named after the Union gunboat that fought the first Confederate, Confederate ironclad. The Allies and their Navy gunboats have killed 200 communists so far, Four Americans are dead. 
Word came today of an airplane crash last Thursday. A twin-engine caribou transport plane crashed along the coast of the China Sea. 26 Americans died. At Long Bean, just 15 miles north of Saigon, Viet Cong rocket fire touched off huge, huge blazes at a supply depot. There were no American casualties. President Johnson today named a new commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps. He is General Leonard Chapman, presently the number two man, who will succeed retiring General Wallace Green at the end of this year. A dead woman's heart is pumping new life through the body of a South American man. Louis Washkansi of Cape Town gambled on medical history's first human heart transplant, and so far he's winning. A 30-member surgical team took the heart from a 25-year-old woman killed in a traffic accident. They transplanted it in the chest of Washkansi, a diabetic. Doctors say Washkansi is doing very well today, better than yesterday, in fact. They describe him as conscious and perfectly lucid. Another crisis will come in about a week. It will be determined then whether Washkansi's body will accept or reject the foreign tissue of the new heart. In New York, Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz of Mamonides Hospital discussed what's being done in this country. We've been doing, and here um, about 4% uh, of the animals are long-term survivors. That is, will live uh, anywhere from six months to a year. Uh, I don't, we have a dog, one dog that has gone a little over a year, and I believe Dr. Shumway in uh, California has one dog with a transplanted heart that has gone for a little bit over a year. But as far as I know, that's about what to look forward to in, in, um, in dog experiments. What this will be in humans, uh, we'll find out. Bert Lard died today. The 72-year-old comedian was the cowardly lion in the movie The Wizard of Oz. But despite all his movie and stage roles, he said that people never recognized him on the street until he did a television commercial series greedily eating Lay's potato chips. This portion of Newsroom was brought to you by Eastern Airlines. Meet Hercules Belleville, shirt tester for Van Heusen. He's off to prove that Vanipress shirts are pressed the day they're made and never need pressing again. Even if you romp in a meadow, go over and under a log, roll over and over and test your permanent press in the clover, or get all tangled up. Easy boy, over here. Don't get nervous. You splash in a stream next, remember? Good boy. Now for the supreme test, washing. Van Heusen Vanipress never needs pressing even after it's washed. See? You've done it, Herky. You've proved that Vanipress shirts are pressed the day they're made and never need pressing again. See Vanipress in Lady Van Heusen and boys wear too. Van Heusen, younger by design. And now, Passport 360, the scent of adventure. Men's cologne and aftershave from Van Heusen. The first to last and last and last. President Johnson's popularity with the people jumps up and down like a yo-yo. Some weeks ago, it hit an all-time low, especially criticizing his handling of the Vietnam War. The latest Harris poll released today reverses the downward trend on the president and the public thinking on the war itself. NBC's White House news correspondent, Ray Shearer, was in Atlanta to talk to the Public Relations Society tonight. He says the president is very conscious of his public image. He cited several reasons for the upturn in the president's popularity. Well, for one thing, it was down about as far as it could be, 23%, and it, uh, if it had gone any further down, it would have been really quite a precipitous slide. Uh, I think it is due to the hard sell the administration put on about the war two weeks ago when General Westmoreland came back, Ambassador Bunker came back, Ambassador Comer, and they all said that the war was going better. The president is out to sell the fact that this war is a success or will be a success, and I suppose he's had some success. The other thing is a, a probably his almost miraculous news conference that he held several weeks ago. Just about the time we considered him a dud on television, he went on and gave the best performance he's ever given as president. And I suppose uh, the people saw that and then thought, well, here's a guy with his back to the wall. He's fighting, and it gives him a, a more aggressive appearance. Uh, probably a more attractive one from the point of view of the voter. Do you think he has a great deal of control over his, uh, his own popularity that, that he, as a politician, can, uh, can generate and, and steer this back up before the election next year? 
Well, he's certainly going to try. Uh, president Johnson is kind of a happening president. If he doesn't do anything, if he hides out and and uh, kind of fades away, his, he tends to slide off. But when he does something, when he goes to a summit conference or when he has a, a good sparkling news conference and when he brings general back, generals back, then he tends to go up. That's why I call him a happening president. And I would think that we're going to see a lot of happenings between now and, say, convention time next August. There are rumors that he is generating some of these happenings, such as a summit conference, possibly with the Russians. Uh, are you aware of any of these? And, and do you think he is going to try and make them happen? Well, it's a little hard to know how many things happen because they're supposed to happen and how many things happen for, uh, for synthetic political purposes. I would say that uh, the president will do things because he uh, sincerely thinks they're going to help, but there will frequently be an element of politics in it. The problem is that there is such suspicion about Mr. Johnson's motives that even when he does something noble like that, uh, people tend not to believe him. Well, popular or not, the president still has to campaign next year, and he may have some problems. Hal Suit has some thoughts along those lines. If the 1968 presidential campaign were in full swing right now, President Johnson would be virtually unable to take to the stump. Demonstrators wouldn't let him. Insight Long Odds with WSB Television's Associate News Director, Hal Suit. Insight takes a second look at people and events in the news and how they shape, change, and mold our everyday lives. The present role being played by protesters, their willingness to riot at the drop of a placard, may be cause for glee in some camps, but it should be a cause for sadness for the entire nation. No government, either out of the past or in existence anywhere today, has been as tolerant in its interpretation of freedom for its citizens. But across the country, there's been example after example of individuals who have abused and shown their contempt for the word freedom in their attempts to shout down, disrupt, or destroy the rights of others, including those of the President of the United States. They have changed the phrase, the right to protest, to a license to do anything, anywhere, at any time. Apparently, some time ago, a number of unsavory characters saw a clear opportunity to exploit what might be called a weakness of any democracy, the desire that no voice be stilled without just cause. Well, with that as a premise, the individuals who have no honest concern for the civil rights movement, and certainly none for the survival of the United States, have been making whoopee. But the situation loses all its humor when a nation reaches the point where its elected chief of state or his close cabinet officers cannot make public appearances. This was as much as admitted by the White House about 10 days ago when every effort was made to keep plans for a New York visit by Mr. Johnson under wraps as long as possible. Only an hour lapsed between his departure from the Capitol and his arrival in New York. Yet somehow the anti-Vietnam demonstrators had time to get their plans made to meet him, and they did. Well, they were worse when Dean Rusk made a New York speech. He had to be slipped into a building through a garage. There may not be any hard legal evidence that a national conspiracy exists to destroy the very fundamentals of freedom, but the word sure seems to get to the right people at the right time. And while these individuals who appear by their dirty dress and manners to be penniless, it isn't hard to find them traveling to their appointed rallies aboard a luxury jet. But even if they hitchhiked, they'd still have to eat, and that costs money. Maybe there is no master hand doing all these things, but a person would have to be rather naive to buy that argument. And no gambler in his right mind would take a bet against it. Hal Suit, Insight, WSB News. Darling, oh. wait. Tonight, don't you set the table? Set the mood with a new Lipton main dish, complete with meat. Complete with meat? Just one step, ready in 15 minutes. 
He loved Lipton beef stroganoff, tender beef, sour cream sauce, golden egg noodles, and turkey primavera. Mmm, choice turkey in real butter sauce. Or chicken baronet and chicken la scala, each with tender chicken. Delicious! He loved it. Honey, you're great. Darling, he's naughty. Light, don't you set the table. Set the mood. It's one of the new Lipton main dishes, complete with meat. A University of Georgia sociologist says urban renewal efforts to save the central business districts of American cities should be abandoned. Dr. John Belcher says the pressure for urban renewal funds comes primarily from downtown merchants who are worried about losing their customers to suburban shopping centers. He told WSB state reporter Kenley Jones that central business districts have very little use in the modern world. If you take a look at the skyline of Atlanta these days, apparently someone is not taking your suggestion because a lot of building is going on. Uh, is this not what you're talking about? Uh, downtown Atlanta is, has a beautiful skyline, but I think you can see only the tall buildings on this skyline, and uh, there will be a few places that are surrounded by acres and acres of uh, parking. Uh, the space is not going to disappear. It's going to remain there, but uh, many of the trade and service functions that used to be in the downtown area are going to disappear and they're or they are disappearing, and there is not much purpose, as far as I'm concerned, in trying to uh, return to the 19th century. Let, let's have a little bit of free enterprise and competition, let things go the way they will without wasting the taxpayers' money uh, to uh, rebuild what's dying. What about the people who work in those skyscrapers downtown. Don't they need services and shops? Uh, they have uh, services and shops probably where they want them, near, where the, uh, near their homes. What about the housing aspect of urban renewal and its replacement of the ghettos? Uh, the ghettos probably are created by trying to cling to the past. Uh, people are moving into the uh, come in from the rural areas and take the cheapest housing that's available and it tends to be largely uh, abandoned or other marginal properties so if you did not try to maintain some of the old functions uh, these probably people would probably move to where uh, their employment and so forth was located and you, you could dispose of ghettos like this by moving the functions out in Go with the trends rather than fighting them. Then you think the pressure on city governments for urban renewal comes from businessmen and vested interests, as you say, who are interested in clinging to the past? Well, to a large extent, yes. What should those businessmen have done? Oh, I would imagine they could have taken some losses on buildings and, and have moved out and tried to anticipate uh, some of the developments that are taking place. Would you discard urban renewal altogether? I would consider urban renewal to be much more than the central business district, to consider the entire city a as a unity and to combine urban renewal with overall uh, planning for the future. That was Dr. John Belcher, a University of Georgia sociologist, who believes that central business districts are outdated and that urban renewal funds to save them could be put to better use. Only Mustang makes it happen. Only Mustang has the key. Mustang moves you. Mustang moves you. Mustang, Mustang sets you free. Let Mustang 68 happen to you. Ford has a better idea and better deals, too. Now the weather, brought to you by the Georgia Power Company. Here's your weatherman, Johnny Beckman. Hi, well, after a fairly icky weekend weather-wise, we got things straightened out today. That's the way it usually is. The weather gets straightened out when everybody has to go back to work and back to school. We really shouldn't complain, though. We've had pretty nice weather for about the last six or seven months, and I guess things are going along about as they should. 
We have generally fair skies through most of the eastern states today with a high pressure system which is centered over the northeastern part of Kentucky. It's uh, part of a ridge of high pressure which extends all down through the southeastern states, giving us generally fair skies today and temperatures running in the 50s in the Carolinas and Tennessee and the 60s in our state and the 70s down in Florida. A little bit of cloudiness down along the southeastern coast of Florida. There has been a storm system which moved through the northeastern states over the weekend. It's now well off the coast, but still strong winds are being felt. Gale warnings are flying from Maine all the way down to Rhode Island. They uh, still have a little bit of snowfall occurring up there, too, but it's tapering off now. Generally fair skies through most of the central states today, up in the upper Mississippi Valley and through the northern plains. There's a low-pressure system which is causing a little bit of rainfall from Kansas down through Oklahoma and into the panhandle region of uh, Oklahoma and Texas. Back of it, there's another storm system which is just now moving on the Pacific coast, a cold front causing some rain in the coastal areas and quite a bit of snow at the higher elevations from Washington all the way down through central California at already up to about two inches of snowfall in some areas in the central part of that state. Well, for us, the high-pressure system, which is uh, over Kentucky, will sort of regroup itself down off the South Atlantic coast tomorrow, will continue to influence our weather. The front, which is now in the southern plains, will move over into the Mississippi Valley tomorrow, probably bringing some rainfall in that area. It looks like the high will be strong enough to give us uh, fair to partly cloudy skies through tomorrow, then a little increase in cloudiness the next day, and the possibility of some shower activity getting into our area probably on Thursday. A high of 60 at Asheville today, 53 at Chattanooga, 62 at Birmingham, and 61 was the high at Montgomery. One of the cooler spots in our state this afternoon was Rome with a 56-degree reading, and it was 67 at Valdosta. That was the warm spot, 62 down at Jacksonville, 67 was the high at Tallahassee. Rather frosty morning throughout the southeast, but with fair skies, things warmed up to pleasant levels this afternoon. Now, in a moment, I'll have that forecast for you for tonight and tomorrow, but now this word from Georgia Power Company. Well, what they're talking about is a frostless electric refrigerator freezer for Mother's Christmas. Just one of a dozen new major electric appliances she would love. Some gifts are easy to hide from Mother before Christmas, like this electric garbage disposer, for instance, or a dehumidifier and others that aren't so easy to hide. An electric dishwasher, electric clothes dryer, a new electric range or built-in, or a food freezer. Electric gifts, big or small, are easy to shop for and always very much appreciated. Well, our high temperature in Atlanta this afternoon was 61 degrees and the low this morning was a cool 27. Gives us an average of 44 degrees for the 24-hour period, and that's two degrees below normal for this time of the year. No rainfall at the Weather Bureau for the 24-hour period. Present temperature reading is 52 degrees. Our surface wind is out of the east at six miles an hour. The air is drying up a little bit now, 38% the relative humidity. Barometer steady at 3026. Now here's the official U.S. Weather Bureau forecast, and it reads, fair and not so cold tonight. Fair to partly cloudy and slightly warmer Tuesday, and Wednesday will be partly cloudy and mild. Our low tonight will be about 32 degrees, and the high tomorrow near 64 degrees. Fair not quite so cold tonight. Fair to partly cloudy and slightly warmer Tuesday, and Wednesday it will be partly cloudy and mild. Low tonight of a freezing 32, high tomorrow about 64. That's the weather. Thanks for watching. Take care. The weather was brought to you tonight by the Georgia Power Company. This is how it starts. Something happens to upset you. Something happens to make you tense up, cause nerves to snap. And with each mounting pressure, excess acid may start to flow in your stomach. First a drop, then another, and another. Result, acid indigestion, heartburn, that burning sensation. That's why wherever you go, always carry Rolaids, one of the most effective medications known for acid relief. Only Rolaids contains this exclusive buffering compound. Rolaids breaks into thousands of tiny particles. Each particle consumes 47 times its weight in excess stomach acid. Helps control the steady acid flow. So always carry Rolaids for fast, long-lasting relief. Handy, convenient Rolaids consumes 47 times its weight in excess stomach acid. Rolaids. Next on Newsroom, the business news brought to you by the First National Bank of Atlanta.
Here's Don McClellan. Good evening. Last Friday, the nation's largest steel producer, United States Steel, announced it was raising the price of steel sheets $5 a ton. Today, the second largest producer, Bethlehem, said it was going to do the same thing. Bethlehem's raise in price will go into effect December 15th. We'll probably see this boost reflected in the price of consumer goods from cars to refrigerators. There could be a nationwide shutdown of all Chrysler production if a strike at a new plant in Indianapolis continues very long. Negotiators for the United Auto Workers and Chrysler last month agreed on a new three-year national contract, but agreement on local issues lagged behind. That's why nearly 3,000 workers at the Indianapolis plant struck this morning. It's a key plant which makes electrical components. When the supply runs out, the rest of Chrysler's production would have to be stopped. J.P. Garner of Atlanta got out of the military service about four years ago, and although he had only about $30 to his name, he and his girl decided to get married. When his old high school friend, Dave West, came through the wedding line, Garner had an idea and told his bride he couldn't go on the honeymoon because he had to talk something over with his friend. It was a plan to go into the engraving business. After talking their landlord into waiting a month for the rent, they opened the specialty engraving company on Spring Street. Today, they're grossing about $100,000 a year with machine and hand engraving. Wes says they could at least triple their business if only they could find qualified workers. The hand engraving cost about four times as much as that done by machine. Garner says it's probably not that much better, but some people just like to say that it's hand engraved. Some insurance companies insist that customers have their fancy hubcaps initial before they'll insure them against theft. The company also does precision work, such as engraving and punching out flight panels for airplanes. Jim Malcolm is the third member of the firm. He joins Garner and West in working night and day to try to keep up with the workload. Garner says their most unique job may have come from a couple of workmen who used a Coke bottle as a drinking cup. It seems someone kept taking their bottle, so they had their name engraved on it. It cost them a dollar. We'll have more business news in just a moment right after this message from the First National Bank of Atlanta. Well, the holiday shopping season is here again. And if you have young folks at your house, you know that shopping for the little things can be expensive. All the teddy bears and tricycles and dolls and footballs can add up. And when you add up the rest of your year-end expenses, you may find yourself with a stack of bills. But there's an easy solution to these year-end holiday money problems. A first National Christmas Club account. Just find out how much you want to save each week, or every other week if you prefer, and next November, you'll receive a check for all your Christmas Club savings. It's a wonderful feeling when the holiday season comes around to have all the cash you need to meet your expenses. So start saving today. Come in any one of First National's 18 convenient offices and open your Christmas Club account. Your weekly payments will be small, but it's the little things that count. The First National Bank of Atlanta. Member FDIC. This was a pretty good day on the New York Stock Exchange, especially if you owned any Xerox stock. It was up $16 a share today. Xerox closed at 314 and a quarter to show a $22 gain over the past two market days. Overall, the market was up, with the Dow Jones Industrial showing a gain of almost four and a half points. The price of an average share traded increased 33 cents. Sales were a whopping 11 and three quarter million today. Among our selected stocks, four out of six on the first board were among the gainers. Ford did the best with a jump of one and one eighth. The second board showed a reverse of the first among the advances and declines, but one of the gainers, National Service Industries, sticks out with an increase of four and three quarter points. Today in Jefferson County, Georgia, a grand jury pointed the finger at five men in the Floyd Horde murder case. Ray Moore and Dick Horner will have that story next. The business news was brought to you tonight by the First National Bank of Atlanta. Good night, Bill. Night, Sue. A handshake instead of a kiss. What's wrong? Breath problem? I use a mouthwash. My old family favorite. Never fear 100's here. Colgate 100. Tastes stronger. Works longer against germs. Sure does taste stronger. Good night, Bill. Good night, Sue. 
Never fear. 100 fear. Colgate 100 gives longer lasting protection against germs than today's best known mouthwash. Tastes stronger, works longer. This isn't an ordinary lime. It's a lime that'll change the world. It's a tender, juicy lime. A tangy, pungent, cool, refreshing, sparkling, crazy, mixed up lime. Sure. Sure. Smell it. Lime. A lime shave cream. It really is lime. Delicious, refreshing, crazy. What do you mean, crazy? Crazy new rapid shave lime. It's a whole new kick in shaving from the makers of regular and menthol. Newsroom continues with the state and local news brought to you by Riches, celebrating 100 happy years. Now here's Ray Moore. Five men have been indicted for the murder of Piedmont solicitor Floyd Horde. The Jackson County Grand Jury returned murder indictments today against the men. Governor Maddox made the announcement and said there would be no more arrests. The five men are all from North Georgia. Two of them, Lloyd George C. and J.H. Blackwell, were arrested by Johnson County Sheriff Roland Attaway ten weeks ago on moonshining charges. One of the others, A.G. Park, was involved in a big liquor raid earlier this year. Governor Maddox called the Johnson County Sheriff the key man in cracking the case. He said Sheriff Attaway has worked closely with other officials. Solicitor Horde was killed when he started his car and dynamite exploded. The exhaustive four-month investigation had a full team of GBI agents since Horde was killed last August the 7th. The governor says the work isn't over yet. It, I believe it wraps it up so far as the investigation is concerned at this time. certainly does not wrap it up. You, uh, you don't wrap up a case until you uh, apprehend and prosecute, and, and if you have what it takes, uh, the conviction or the acquittal, whatever is necessary, then it's wrapped up. This completes the arrest. I believe it does. I believe it, com it makes a, a, a complete arrest so far as the, the apprehension is concerned, yes. The governor says he believes the illegal liquor business was a prime reason for Horde's death. Ford had a record for cracking down on bootleggers. The former sheriff, L.G. Perry, resigned under fire after a grand jury said that Perry failed to clean up alleged illegal liquor operations. Four of the five men indicted today are in jail. The only one at large is George Worley. He was last seen driving a 1956 Chevrolet. It's black with maroon-colored hubcaps. Officers say the car probably has dealer's license tags. Late film arrived from Jefferson a few minutes ago, and we've scheduled it for 6.55, about 25 minutes from now. More news after word from Riches. Riches, a golden Christmas world of dazzling gifts for her, of pretty and practical gifts for the home, of toys and all the Christmas joys for children. Of little delights and timely ones. Come to Riches. After all, it's been your Christmas store every happy year since 1867. Fire broke out late this afternoon in the old First National Bank building at Five Points. When fire department units first reached the scene, it looked bad. Assistant Fire Chief Steve Campbell said flames were jumping two to 300 feet into the air. The blaze apparently broke out in a seventh floor air conditioning unit. The unit is located on the roof, which made it look as though the whole building was afire. Firefighters quickly contained the blaze. The building was evacuated and there were no injuries. Chief Campbell said the heat from the flames broke out windows in the building and enabled firemen to pour water on the flames. At one point, a second alarm went out, but when these pieces of equipment reached the scene, they were used as backup units. Campbell blames faulty wiring, an engine, or fan belt slippage in the air conditioning unit for starting the blaze. That film shot about two hours ago. Rapid transit and the dollars, the deadlines, and the digging involved were all discussed on WSB Television's news conference this morning at 9.30. The guest was Henry Stewart, the general manager of Atlanta's Metropolitan Area Rapid Transit Authority. Stewart said that completion of just the first stage of Atlanta's proposed rapid transit system will cost about $332 million, and about $200 million will have to be local money. 
Stewart said it could be raised by increasing taxes three mills in Fulton County and 1.6 mills in DeKalb County. He said the need now is for some public hearings on the subject. Then he said he hopes voters will approve the money at the polls in 1968. That would allow digging to begin by 1970. Newsman Jim Whipke had a question about the actual digging process. Uh, when you start digging, when you start tearing up, are you going to literally tear up peach tree or uh, uh, will all of this construction be underground and unnoticed to the people on top? The method of construction depends a whole lot on how deep we are in the street and what are the other circumstances we run into in the way of rock or soil, you public utilities. This has to be studied foot by foot. We're doing that now. Do you think there's any possibility that, say, a section of one of the peach trees will be impassable for a year or two? Is this one of the consequences we might expect from construction of rapid transit? It won't last for a year. The time element, if it's necessary to do the, the subway construction on what we call cut and cover, this is where you dig a ditch, build a subway and cover it up. The way this is done, the street is opened up, and then as soon as it's deep enough to get headroom, this may be six or eight weeks, a block or two at a time, then it's planked over and traffic can be restored. Then the traffic can run on this planking for a couple of years while the work continues underneath. And then when it's finished, the planking comes off and the hole is filled up again. And this again takes maybe six or eight weeks. Stewart also said that while buses might provide a cheaper and quicker solution, they would not be a long-term solution in his view. But the opposing view got some added strength later in the day. At this afternoon's meeting of the Atlanta Board of Aldermen, a resolution was presented by Alderman Everett Milliken. It called for the Atlanta Region Metropolitan Planning Commission to study bus transit as a permanent as well as an interim part of the city's rapid transit plans. I'm concerned about the cost, we're talking about $500 million. Well, the time this thing gets built with inflation and everything else, we may be talking about $700 million and so forth. And I know, and I think every member of this board knows that rapid transit would not be of any particular benefit in this city unless there's some other form of transportation to go along with it. Because there's too much area we got for 31 or 62 or 54 miles of rapid transit. The resolution passed, and the use of the bus, as often mentioned in recent days, will get some further consideration. The board also selected the city's representatives for the newly formed Model Cities Executive Board. They are Everett Milliken, the sponsor of the resolution on buses, and Alderman Gregory Griggs. The governor had his own meeting on transportation today. The governor's office was full of people connected with transportation in almost every and any form throughout the state of Georgia. Mayor Ivan Allen, DeKalb County Chairman Brent Manning, and representatives of the Highway Department, Rapid Transit Authority, and the Atlanta Transit System were all there. Governor Maddox invited them all into his office, and after a half-hour closed-door session, Maddox came out and talked about it. This was a meeting with state officials, city, county, and the metropolitan there uh, to discuss the possibility of setting up a format that will include a comprehensive statewide a uh, transportation uh, uh, study and program that will uh, help us plan for the 80s and 90s and the 21st centuries just ahead. These uh, various opponents and proponents of getting people where they want to go are having trouble getting together. Are you trying to get them to agree on something? Well, this is absolutely the purpose of it. Yes, sir. This is not a, a city of Atlanta project or metropolitan Atlanta project or metropolitan any other area project, but uh, this is a responsibility that that the state should have uh, be uh, fully represented in, and I don't think we've, uh, uh, in the past, uh, really coordinated our efforts and had the comprehensive study that's needed. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. announced at a press conference today the plans have been made for a massive march on Washington next spring. Dr. King explained to newsmen that the SCLC will begin organizing the leadership for the march very soon. Then the protest, designed to get jobs for all, he said, will begin around April 1st in the capital city. The marches will converge on the capital from 10 major cities. Newsman asked Dr. King the further purpose of the massive demonstration. No, this is no attempt to embarrass uh, the president uh, in an election year. This is an attempt to 
uh, really get some responsive action from the federal government to grapple with the, tr the, the great economic crisis and the great economic problem that we face in the Negro community. Uh, very frankly, this is a search for an alternative to riots. And uh, if the nation doesn't respond to us, as we labor that two or three months, however long it takes, uh, God only knows what we will face in terms of chaos. This is a kind of last desperate demand for the nation to respond to nonviolence. The rumble of marching feet was heard again today outside the Army's induction center on Ponce de Leon. The cadence of the march was not to Army drums, but rather to the rhythm of dissent against the war that has been popular here in this country of late. The 60 marchers carried placards that read, Hands off Vietnam, and caution, military service is hazardous to your health. The group was protesting the induction of one of its number, Gene Guerrero, who applied as a conscientious objector, but later was turned down. This morning, he refused induction. The cab's new grand jury got a suggestion today. It might wish to check into sales of liquor in the dry county. Judge Frank Guest reminded the grand jurors that they could present indictments if they found evidence of liquor sales in private clubs or anywhere else. The FBI says a man charged with robbing a Macon Branch bank last week was picked up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. 30-year-old Samuel Franklin Brown of Macon was arrested as he stepped off a commercial airliner in San Juan. Brown carried a revolver and had about $2,000 in cash with him. An accomplice is still being sought. The news continues after this word from Riches. Shopping days are full of joy under the great tree at Riches. It's a golden Christmas world of gifts. Even the hours are golden. Extra shopping time till 9.30 each night, Monday through Saturday, at all six stores. There's more time to shop, more gift items to choose from for everyone on your list. And as always, Riches Credit makes all your gift buying easier, more pleasant. So many, many reasons to make Riches your golden Christmas world of gifts. Jackie Kennedy's sister, Lee Radziwill, was in town today, along with author Truman Capote. They had a brief stopover on their way to Montgomery, where they're doing another TV special. WSB's Gloria Crow was among reporters who talked with them at the airport. Ms. Radziwill, are you serious about acting? Of course I am. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. Right. Critics, after your stage debut, were not entirely complimentary. Did that discourage you in any way? Not at all. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing Laura. I wouldn't have done Laura. Now, how do you answer critics who say that uh, you're getting places or being given parts because you're Jackie Kennedy's sister? Well, I think there has to be more to it than that. Do you think she's a good actress? Oh, yes, I do indeed. Why? <laughs> she's got great presence. She, uh, great presence on film. And, uh, photographs marvelously, and has a very good uh, voice. Being Jackie Kennedy's sister, has this helped or hurt? I have no idea. It has nothing to do with it. What about frequent reports that your sister plans to remarry? Do you think uh -huh. she ever will? No, 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 no. that. <laughs> oh. Our editorial cartoon tonight has to do with DeKalb County. We'll look at it in just a moment. This portion of Newsroom was brought to you by Riches, celebrating 100 happy years. Great design, Tom. You really made it work. But uh, what's that tree doing on the roof? <laughs> How did that happen? Instant transplant. Come on, I'll give you a lift. Hey, that was a fast cigarette. <laughs> no taste left on. Yeah? Never happens with mine. You have one. Viceroy, huh? Yeah. What makes them so different? Beats me. Viceroy always tastes good. Taste never quits. Hey, we better get a move on before they lock up that parking lot. Yeah, and I have to boost you over the fence. <laughs> hey, you know, this Viceroy does taste good. Taste never quits. Viceroy starts with great tobaccos, then adds natural flavor fresheners to make sure the good taste never quits. Viceroy, the good taste never quits. 
And now tonight's editorial cartoon by Bill Daniels. any size toast to order, thick or thin, long or short, even odd shapes, in the amazingly versatile fully automatic general electric toaster oven. Toasts both sides at once. Bakes like an oven too. Bake brown and serve rolls, frozen pies, potatoes, even a delicious meatloaf. And there's a special top browner for English muffins, hors d'oeuvres, the versatile automatic general electric toaster oven. This General Electric Peekabrew coffee maker is completely immersible for thorough cleaning to assure truly delicious coffee every time. As many as nine five-ounce cups. And to produce just two or three cups of clear, rich, full-flavored coffee, it has GE's exclusive mini-brew basket, which fits inside the regular basket. The General Electric Peekabrew immersible coffee maker with exclusive mini-brew basket. Next on Newsroom, the sports with Milo Hamilton and Carl Sell, brought to you by the Pure Oil Company. Hello again, everybody. The SEC basketball race gets underway tonight as Kentucky's heralded sophomores meet an explosive Florida quintet. The Wildcats rolled over Michigan Saturday as Florida buried Jacksonville. The only other SEC scrap tonight is Auburn playing at Vanderbilt. Vandy is nationally ranked. They dropped from 9th to 11th in the rankings that came out this evening, however, and barely beat SMU. And Wackheider's Yellow Jackets play at SMU tonight, so Tech could get some idea as how they compare with Vandy and the SEC. Then come home for a Thursday night date with Georgia in the Tech Dome. The Bulldogs trotted out a high-scoring team and rewrote the record book in bombing Arkansas A&M. Ken Roseman's boys are idle until the Tech date. Bill Carter's Oglethorpe Petrels are in action at home tomorrow night with uh, South Carolina State College, and Georgia State plays at home Friday night, University of the South. Well, the Falcons took their second loss in three weeks from the Los Angeles Rams yesterday. Defensively, the team played well, but the offense was unable to generate much of anything in the second half. The Birds will be back home to wrap up the season for the next two weeks against San Francisco and the Chicago Bears. Elsewhere in the league, the Cleveland Browns stayed on top of the Century Division yesterday with a 24-11 win over the Giants. And the Browns took advantage of a giant offside on the opening kickoff. On the second kick, Benny Davis takes the ball on his own nine-yard line and returns at 63 yards to the Giant 28. Later, Lou Groza added a 15-yard field goal, giving Cleveland a 3-0 lead. Linebacker Jim Houston, who had quite an afternoon, prevented a tie several plays later, blocking a 50-yard field goal attempt by Pete Gogolak. The Browns then marched downfield for a score by the league's leading rusher, Leroy Kelly, running 12 yards to the one and taking it over for the score. That made it Cleveland 10-0. Then later in the first half, the Browns Frank Ryan threw a touchdown pass 24 yards to Gary Collins make it 18 to nothing. In the third period the Giants tried a fake field goal but Browns tackle Jim Kanicki broke it up dropping Joe Morrison. The Giants finally scored in the third period as Joe Morrison carried John Brewer with him into the end zone. There he goes. On the next play the Giants successfully completed an onside kick thanks to Pete Gogolak. Just as things were looking up for the Giant. Fran Tarkington, the giant quarterback, dropped straight back. His pass intended for Aaron Thomas, but it was intercepted by Cleveland linebacker Jim Houston, who gives Tarkington a little shot in the jaw and goes all the way, 79 yards for the score. The final score, Browns 24, Giants 14. I'd say that fellow ought to move into the boxing eliminations for the heavyweights. That was a pretty good left. Tennessee goes into the books as the 1967 SEC football champion, but Alabama fans have another chapter to add to the history of Bear Bryant. The Bear closed out another fine season as the Tide stopped Auburn in the mud 7-3. The win gave Bama second place in the race. Only one more game left this Saturday. Florida plays Miami, and Miami goes on to the Blue Bonnet Bowl. 
Well, the SEC schedule's all but completed. Six teams have to get ready for those bowl dates. Georgia and the Liberty on the 16th. Tennessee in the Orange. Alabama travels to the Cotton. Ole Miss in the Sun. LSU in the Sugar. And Florida State in the Gator. A pretty good batting average for the SEC. Something new in tennis rackets. And a few tips on how to make the right purchase. Carl will have that feature after this word from Pure Oil. At racetracks across the country, the grind gets mighty tough. The men are hard, the cars are fast, being good just ain't enough. Go with the big red bird. Firebird racing gasoline. They go with the big red bird. The Pure Oil Company has been blending Firebird racing gasoline for years. That's why they know how to blend the powerful premium gasoline for your car. Pure Firebird Super, closest thing to racing gasoline. Firebird Super Gasoline gives you power to pass safely. When you need it, power to climb. Go with the big red bird. Pure Firebird Super. Go with the big red bird. Get it at the sign of pure. Well, you can't play the game without a racket, and Jack Rogers here at the Bitsy Grant Tennis Center is going to bring us up to date on that today. Jack, uh, starting out in the game of tennis, uh, what would be a suitable type racket, and what should you look for for a beginner? Well, um, a beginner does not want to start with a racket that is not good enough for a decent player to play well with, so I would suggest he get a medium price racket. Uh, you can, on today's market, you can get a, a good tennis racket for a beginner about $12, $14. Does the stringing make any difference? Uh, yes, it certainly does. However, most of these rackets are going to be strung with nylon, and they're going to be strung about 50, 52, 3 pounds, which is pretty good pressure for a beginner. And uh, if you'll uh, be sure and get the right weight and right uh, uh, grip handle size, then uh, they'll, they'll be pretty well ready to go uh, after the game of tennis. Now, what are we talking about when we graduate up into a little better racket? Well, uh, the rackets, of course, will be the same size and dimensions, but they will be different weights. Uh, your better rackets uh, generally come unstrung because each player likes to have his own strings, his own t uh, tension on the strings. Uh, they also get the racket to suit their grips. Grips run four and a half, four and five eighths, four and three quarters, so you want to get one that's comfortable for you to feel and to your feel and for you so you can handle it. Now, what are we talking about as far as the difference in type of stringing? Maybe the better players want the gut. Yes, your better players do want your gut. However, your nylon now, is, they've improved it so much that uh, I'd say 75% of the people still are playing with nylon, but your top players will use gut. It has more resiliency, gives you a little more zip, a little more control, and they do prefer it. Now, how about the youngsters that are starting out? Does this make a difference in the type of racket? Is there a smaller racket? Than well, they are, if the youngster is five, six, seven years old, then you're going to have to get a, a junior size racket, which is usually about one to two inches shorter and just lightened down all over. And uh, they have to have one that they can swing. Now, uh, if they're eight or nine, I believe in getting them started on a regular size racket. Get the lightest racket you can find in a small grip but let them get it started with a regular size racket. Well, Jack, thank you so much. And the next time we get together, we're going to talk about the newest innovation in tennis, and that's the steel racket. I think the most important thing to bear in mind is to take advantage of the services of the professionals of the various tennis centers and the sporting goods dealers in your area. Don't go buying blind now. Tennis equipment is their business, and they're more than willing to help you get the right product. Somebody says that we mentioned that Florida State was in the SEC. That wasn't the way we worded it. We just happened to be included in the SEC finishing story. We mentioned there was one big game left, so we're not trying to put them in that conference. We also mentioned that Vanderbilt had dropped out of the top ten, and here are the new ratings. UCLA Bell Area winner is still number one. Louisville second, Houston third, Kansas fourth, North Carolina fifth, Dayton sixth, Princeton seventh, Purdue jumped from nowhere to eighth, Boston College ninth, Tennessee is tenth. Former sports announcer and organizer in the American Football League, Harry Wismer, died today in New York City. And veteran pro golfer Bo Winninger is reported in critical condition in Oklahoma City. In a closing note, Carl, what are the odds on a pro golfer winning his first entered tournament? Fairly long, Milo, because I think Marty Fleckman, who won the tournament yesterday down on the Cajun Classic, is the first man ever to do it. And he did it very strongly, coming out with two birdies in the regulation round. Then he won the birdie, scored a birdie in the playoffs. So he's here to stay. You bet he is. That's the sports still now.
Carl will see you at 11, a special feature coming up. The Sports with Milo Hamilton and Carl Sell was brought to you by the Pure Oil Company. The cat is out of the bag. Mercury Cougar, car of the year, looks for new worlds to conquer for 68. With sleek European styling, concealed headlamps, sequential turn signals, deep padded bucket seats, and a luxurious cat quick way of moving. All standard in every Mercury Cougar. Pound for pound, dollar for dollar. The best equipped luxury sports car in America. And now meet the new king of the big cats, the seven liter Cougar GTE, powered by a big, silky smooth 427 cubic inch V8. Mercury Cougar, Cougar GTE. The big cats are out of the bag. From Lincoln Mercury, Better Idea Cars, from the makers of Lincoln Continental. WSB newsman Pat O'Dell and Ken Goodnight have just returned from Jefferson, where five men were indicted by a grand jury in the murder of solicitor Floyd Horde. When they arrived, they found one of the suspects, A.C. Cliff Park, being taken away to an undisclosed prison. Three other suspects are already in jail. The 76-year-old Park was arrested by Horde in May of 1967 for bootlegging. At the time of the first arrest, more than 2,000 cases of beer were taken from him. After the Horde killing, a building owned by Park was padlocked because there was further evidence that he was still selling illegal beer. Reporter Ken Goodnight spoke to GBI Chief Barney Ragsdale and Solicitor Wesley Channel about today's indictment. Uh, we have all the suspects in custody except uh, George Worley from Commerce. We have a lookout on him right now. Where are the men being held? Well, they are being held at uh, various jails uh, throughout the area because of the facilities here. They don't have the adequate facilities to take care of uh, prisoners like this. As head of the GBI, what is your reaction to the grand jury indictments? We're naturally happy, and the agents have done a wonderful job. We're mighty proud of all the agents and the sheriff of Johnson County. Uh, they have worked hard and diligently, and we're mighty proud of them. When will these men go to trial? They're scheduled to be arraigned on Friday, February, I mean, uh, December the 15th, and uh, there has been a special jury drawn to convene on Monday the 18th, at which time we would be ready to proceed with trials. Have any special conditions been set for the trial? No, not so far. There have been no, no ground rules defined. I might say in my particular case that, that uh, I've asked the governor to appoint, and he did appoint Mr. Luther G. Hames here, who is Solicitor General Emeritus of the Cobb Judicial Circuit, as a special prosecutor in this case with me. Can you reveal any details of the investigation? No, sir, we cannot at this time. We, uh, you know the names of the people who've been indicted and the, the date and so forth, and that's all that we can divulge at this time. Worley, the man still at large, is listed by the GBI as an auto salesman. The 46-year-old man was last seen driving a black 1956 Chevrolet with maroon hubcaps. The others indicted besides Park and Worley are Douglas Pinion of Jefferson, John Blackwell of Ball Ground, and Lloyd C. of Dawsonville. In other news, there was a fire this afternoon in the old First National Bank building in downtown Atlanta. Most of the damage was confined to the bank's air conditioning system. There were no injuries. The weather, fair and not so cold through tomorrow. The low tonight, 32. A high tomorrow, 64. The low tomorrow night, 36. Right now, it's 49 degrees. With the market, the Dow Jones Industrials closed at 883 and a half, up 434 on a volume of 11 and three quarter million shares. Now stay tuned to Chet Huntley and David Brinkley. This is the newsroom, now expanded to one hour to give you the South's most complete television news coverage. Six o'clock newsroom was a live color presentation of WSB Television News, portions pre-recorded.